Blue? Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to our speaker series at the North Austin Photo Photographic Society. I have to do that right, you know. And then there's Mary. Yeah. Okay, uh, just a couple of things uh, before we uh, get into the, uh, what Carol is gonna talk about tonight. To uh, next, because if I do this, it will blow everybody out. Okay, hi, uh, so next meeting would normally occur on July 4th, which it's not going to. It's going to occur on July 11th. And instead of meeting in this room, because the church has already leased this room out because we didn't acquire this room for that date, you go around the side of the building, over here on the west side, giant parking lot, there's a ramp that goes down to a door down there and we will be meeting downstairs. Uh, that way we don't have to be up here at all, other than to get the equipment. So that's the only piece of uh, housekeeping that I can think of. It is a, uh, a competition night on the 11th, so uh, looking forward to having everybody there and uh, listening to the judges who will remain nameless at the moment. Uh, okay, so this evening we have Carol Schiraldi. Carol has been working in the field of fine art photography and art itself, yes. as in right. painting, if I'm not mistaken, yes. a little bit, painting. yes, Paint, uh, since 1992. So she has a pretty good, strong background uh, in the field. And tonight she's going to be talking about getting your work to the next level. So I'm sure you're open to questions at almost any time. So wonderful. I will put the microphone down and get out of the way. I want to be the type of photographer with work that takes me places I can't even begin to imagine. Not the type of photographer are out of reach. I don't know about you, but that involves getting my work to. My name's Carol. Thanks for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. I want to give a special shout out to Ty and Clay and everyone at NAPES for having me and all the work they do behind the scenes. Um, for the folks on Zoom, welcome as well. Um, this meeting will be recorded. Um, and also know that um, we'll be trying to get you the slides afterwards, so if you're taking notes, frantically trying to read what's happening, um, don't panic, we'll get you all the slides afterwards. Um, so those of you who know me, I think most of you know me, but just in case you don't, I'm sometimes a judge at, at NAPES and I've worked with the club for a long time. I'm a long time member, I guess, I guess you'd say. And I, as, as Captain mentioned, I'm a fine art photographer. One thing I've seen in the club is that a lot of folks, they shoot a lot of images, they do a lot of great images, right? And then they sort of do nothing with them, right? They just sort of, it's like a black hole, right? They just sort of end right there, right? So we wanna think about moving to the next level. Now that may mean different things for different people, right? You may be a portrait photographer, maybe you wanna get more clients, you may be a wedding photographer, you may wanna help save the whales, you may be like me, you wanna sell Matt, you know, prints and framed art. Um, whatever that is, whoever you are, there's, there's a next step for you. So uh, the, tonight we're really going to dive in and share some strategies and tips and techniques and maybe even roadblocks on how to move to the next level, whatever that might be for you. So uh, what we're going to talk about, I've broken it um, the first thing I'm going to do, this is a little bit different for me. I've done this presentation before, and I've noticed that sometimes people really get in their own way. A lot of times when you talk about artist marketing and advancing your work and advancing your career, what happens is I feel like I'm talking to folks that are standing in a bucket, and they're trying to lift the bucket up by their handles. Right? They don't realize they, they're in their own way, and they've got to get out of the bucket before they can lift. Right? So we're going to do a little thing I call the mindset reset. Right, I'm going to get us in the mindset, get our minds in a good place where we can move our work to the next level. Right, then I'm going to go over some tools of the trade. Now, this is a little bit difficult because I mentioned that you know some of you might be wedding photographers, some of you might be fine art, some of you might be other things, but I'll share some common tools and things that will help you on your journey towards whatever your next level might be. And then to wrap it up, we'll do some problem solving, anything we table along the way, any, anything anybody has other questions about, or if there's time, anything we want to di dive into. A couple of notes to get us started. Um, everyone's marketing journey is really unique. 
right? So I may tell you, oh, you have to be on Instagram, you have to have a thousand followers. And you say, but I have my own gallery and I have all this foot traffic and I make a million dollars a year. My response is gonna be keep making a million dollars, make two million next year and ignore Instagram, right? So I'm trying to give you, it's, it's kind of hard for me sometimes to do this presentation, right? Because basically everybody's at a different level, a different starting point and everybody's going in a different direction. And my job is to kind of give you a map. Right, so I can't get everybody's needs all the time, right? I have to kind of give you a default, try this, it might work, right? So um, with that said, your journey is yours and yours unique. So I'm hoping I can help you. I hope we can share some ideas and some common ground, but if you, by all means, if you find something that works or you, something just doesn't resonate with you, don't do it. Um, those of you who know me know that I have a website. Um, it was built in conjunction with folks in town. There's a, an outfit called Art Storefronts, um, or ASF. This is not a sales pitch for Art Storefronts. I wanna make that very clear. Instead, what I've done is I've taken, Art Storefronts has very many marketing experts, and they, I on um, Zoom calls with them daily. They're my consultants, they work with me, they tell me trends and different things I can do to market my work. So what I've done is I've taken some of that material and shared it with you tonight. So know that this is, if I mention ASF, it's not because I'm trying to sell ASF, it's because I'm sharing the info from ASF. Um, I try to help out the Austin community whenever I can. I'm not an art coach. I'm not even a professional marketeer. I just do it myself and I'm sharing what I've learned over time. Um, if you know me also from the group, you know that um, I'm sometimes, as a judge, I, I try to be nice, especially to beginners, right? I try to be the kind judge, right? Well, the door is locked, right? So I, I can say, no, I'm a little bit of a mean teacher, right? So tonight, oh, did you have a question? <laughs> I'm a little bit of a mean teacher, right? So there will be homework assignments, right? The door's locked, right? There might be math, right? The door's still locked, right? Um, <laughs> there could be a pop quiz, right? Um, know that that's how this is gonna run, right? And also, because I am Quirky Carol, I'll tell you some, st I, I thought it would be good to have sort of story time with Carol, right? And I'm gonna share some marketing stories that will be sort of exaggerated, right? With the, with the idea that we'll, we'll exaggerate something and you will hopefully get the moral of the story from that. Hopefully that will be more entertaining, maybe a little bit funny and still a good um, transfer of information. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so with that, let's get started. Um, the mindset reset. What do I mean by a mindset reset? Well, um, I'm gonna have to read this piece. So um, I may have to come up here and actually read this part. So there's two common issues that people face. And I wanna be clear, um, I'm not a shrink. There might be more than two issues that you could be facing, right? My couch isn't even comfortable, really, if I, if I get down to it right. I picked two that were really common that I see a lot of artists struggle with, right? You might have what's behind door number three, right? You might want to be a, a black and white master printer and maybe you have an irrational childhood fear of enlargers. I can't really help you with that one. Right? You're kind of on your own. But know that in order to get to the next level, if you really want to be that master black and white printer, you're going to have to get over your fear of enlargers one way or another. Um, I just don't have a slide for it, okay? So with that said, um, there's two things I think I've seen time and again that, and especially with this group in particular, one of them is imposter syndrome. Has anyone here heard of imposter syndrome? Raise your hand if you have a few hands go up, right? So yeah, so it's, it's kind of common. It's especially tough on people in the arts. And we'll talk a little bit about that. I want to keep this very brief, but we will touch on this because I think it's important. And the other one is tiara syndrome. Has anyone heard of tiara syndrome? I bet no hands are there. Okay, so it's almost as common and you probably don't know its name, right? So um, I'm going to read these so we get the textbook definition of them, right? So imposter syndrome, is technically defined as the condition of feeling anxious and not feeling successful despite being high performing in external objective ways. 
This condition often results in people feeling they are a fraud, a phony, and doubting themselves. Right? So we'll talk about each of these a little bit more, how they relate to our photography and art. And the second one, I am like the poster syndrome for tiara, I'm like the poster child for tiara syndrome, so I know this one well, but the textbook definition is someone who feels that if you do your job well, someone will notice and come and place a tiara on your head. The belief that you'll be crowned with a tiara of success by keeping your head down, working hard, over preparing, and one day the right people will notice, right? It's kind of like you, one day your prince will come, right? That's how you, you see yourself, right? So the antidote to these is for imposter syndrome, you need to get your work out there. For tiara syndrome, uh, I'm sorry, for, for imposter syndrome, your work is good enough. You have to accept that. For tiara syndrome, you have to get your work out there. And again, I mentioned I want to kind of talk about these a little bit more, because I do think they plague the group um, in, in general. I mean, we, we see a lot of it, right? So your work is good enough, right? I mentioned that I'm a judge for the, for the competition sometimes. And often, even the beginner's work, when it comes up, the judge's panel will say, God, this stuff is really good, right? When we judge work, when we close these doors and we come in here and we judge our work, we are looking for improvements that we can suggest to you, ways you can get your work, make your work better, ways your images can be more successful, right? You can have an image that has 10 things right with it and maybe one little flaw, and the idea is for you to improve our job is to sort of hunt down that flaw and tell you like, look, next time do this, right? It's a good image, but next time do this, right? And a lot of times you leave feeling that you didn't take a good image, right? It doesn't always happen, but you know, it can, right? So we want to make sure we, we, we don't have those feelings and we want to tackle this because I think a lot of times too, if you think about your work, photography itself, right? It's all a ladder. Like think of it as a big ladder, right? There are some people that are maybe work isn't as good as yours, and there are some people that are better than you, right? You're always going to be climbing that ladder, right? So you need to accept that your work is good enough to take it to the next level, right? So one thing is we really, our first homework assignment, we really have to watch our language. Right? We have to, our la it sounds kind of silly, but our language frames who we are, right? W when we use words to define ourselves, we define ourselves by the words we use, right? So when you hear someone say, I'm only a beginner, right? I'm not a real photographer, right? That's, that's my friend. Patrick, did you know there are real photographers out in the bushes? And if we say the wrong thing, they're going to come in and get us and, and revoke our photogra real, you know, fake photographer pass for the day? No, right? right? Really, I mean, you know, the door is closed, right? Look around the room. The real photographer, you know, there's, there's a horror movie, right? Remember when someone says that, the, you know, the voice is, the, the call is coming from inside the house. Did everyone remember that, that horror movie, right? The real photographers are in the room, folks. This is it, this is us. We are real photographers. We're as real as it gets, right? Your work is good enough. We are as real as it gets. You can do this, right? I'm just a beginner, right? I'm not a real photographer. My other favorite one, I'm not an artiste. Right. They don't even use the word artist, right? Because they have to, I'm not an artiste. Did anyone hear, everyone hear me saying that? I'm not an artiste, right? I got news for you. Photography is art, right? If you take photos, you're an artist, right? Unless you literally picked a camera up yesterday, you could still be a, you, you can be a beginner, but you're still a good photographer. Your work is worthy of, of going to the next level, right? So I really want our homework assignment, I want you to take this to heart, right? Everybody is a beginner and nobody is a beginner, right? Photography is a craft that's practiced over time. We're all on our journey of improving, but that doesn't mean that you can't get your work to the next level. Embrace the fact that your work is good enough. When you hear yourself, when you hear somebody else say, I'm only a beginner, I'm not an artiste, I'm not a real photographer like those people in the bushes hunting Patrick and I. Right? 
When well, I hear that, like, I'm not a real photographer. It's like, so I'm imagining. Yeah, I, I'm a hologram. I, I don't exist, right? I, I mean, it, it sounds kind of silly, right? But I mean, if you were a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, you would call yourself that, right? So why don't you call yourself a photographer? Right, it's really kind of a, a, and a lot of people say, well, this is marketing, why are you doing this? Because if you don't get through some of this, you won't get to be able to market your work. It's very important, right? And the other thing is that, especially for artists, one of the things that happens is we, we reject our work as we, you know, a lot of times what happens is you start to do shows, right? You're in the competitions, you get do well, you get a show. Then your, show, then your work is shown with people who you haven't seen before, different photographers. Suddenly it's a different pool and you feel very inadequate and suddenly you say, oh my God, you know, I'm, I'm not as good as these people, right? Imposter syndrome is a natural part of artistic development, unfortunately, right? Because as we improve, as we grow, at times we will feel like, oh my God, we're not up to the people that were, we've been dumped with, right? <laughs> yeah, question? Uh, no, just kind of a comment on the same lines. Yes. If you've been compensated for your photography, you're a professional. Yes, yes. I, I was gonna. I, I had. I was gonna do an exercise. Like, you might be. A, you know those jokes. Like, you might be a redneck, right? You might be a real photographer if you've won a competition, if you've won a People's Choice, if you moved up in a category, if you've been paid for someone to do your work, if your work has appeared in a publication or book, if you've been in an exhibition, right? All of these things make you real. Right? The the people in the bushes. The, you know, the call is coming from in the house. I mean, I really mean that when I say that, right? That horror movie, right? But also know that it is part of, just this morning I, I mentioned ASF. I was on a call with ASF and the topic was imposter syndrome, right? It hits people who are artists making six figures. They have the same issue, right? It doesn't go away as you get more and more successful. The other thing about it is a lot of times before you have an artistic breakthrough, you reject all of your work, right? So you feel like, no, it isn't good enough, right? And that's like really, it's the same part of imposter syndrome, right? So what, there, in the past, there's been painters who like, they burnt their whole studio down, right? Because they were like, no, 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 this isn't good anymore, right? You need to recognize that that's imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome speaking, right? And address it, right? Because as you move up and do more with your work, if it hasn't hit you already, it will, right? And you want, I shouldn't be laughing, but it will, right? So you wanna make sure you kinda of nip it in the butt, right? So some language you can use instead. The art world likes to say, emerging, I'm emerging, right? Enthusiastic, new to the craft if you really are a beginner. And I like this one, I bring a fresh perspective, right? Bring a fresh perspective. Right. You don't have to say, I'm not an artist, I'm only a beginner, I'm not a real photographer. Right? I bring a fresh perspective. Right? It's my, it's, it will reframe the way you think about yourself. So this brings us to our first story time with Carol. Um, I mentioned I am the poster child for tiara syndrome, right? So um, when I was younger, I played music um, before I took up painting and photography and all the other crap that I do. Um, I played a bunch of instruments. I played the flute and I played the guitar. I'm going to probably date myself here, but when I was a teenager, Neil Young was very popular. Has anyone heard of, has anyone heard of Neil Young? Somebody please nod. <laughs> Patrick's going, yeah, I think so. Okay, great. Right. So for those of you who are young, Neil Young was a musician who played uh, sort of like these three chord songs. They were easier to learn on the guitar, I'll say, right? So imagine I'm in my room and I'm playing my Heart of Gold, and I think I can still play Heart of the Gold on a guitar, which is a little bit amazing, because um, you know, I've so many beers, I've forgotten everything. But you know, as I'm playing, you know, and, and then maybe I go to school and I, you know, Neil Young's song comes on the radio and I tell my friend like, oh, you know, I, I can play Neil, I can't whisper with this, but I can play Neil Young on the guitar. And my friend says, you know, oh, you know, you and you and you, you guys should form a band, right? So now I, I look at my little room and I say, oh gosh, we, we can't fit in the room anymore, right? so let's go to the garage, right? So we form, you know, this beautiful garage band, right? 
And we're in the garage and we're practicing and we're practicing and we're playing and we're playing and we are just getting better and better and better, right? Just better and better and better, right? Then one day, our mailman's walking by, you know, delivering the letters, and he hears the sound coming from the garage. It's like, hark, what is this, right? Wow, that band's pretty good. This is, you know, this is story time with Carol, so don't, don't collapse. Any of you who've been musicians, don't fall over laughing too hard, right? So he says, hark, this band is quite good. I think I'm going to record them. So he takes a little recording of us without us knowing, right? Just records us, right? And then, as luck would have it, there's a music producer that lives across town that's also on the postal route, right? So our postman goes over, delivers letters, and is across town. Now, this, this music producer is, I mean, beyond famous, right? Like, discovered Bruce Springsteen. Um, you know, I heard Cheap Trick in the car. Like, was, was the fifth member of Cheap Trick, you know, when they were performing. Like, first name basis with Madonna. He, he calls her M, right? You know? <laughs> and, and Taylor Swift, she was Taylor Slow until she met him. Right? That's how famous this guy is. Right? And as luck would have it, he's out mowing his lawn. Right? Again, work of fiction, work with me here. Right? He, he doesn't have a garden. He's out mowing his lawn. Right? And our, our postman comes up and says, you know, you got to hear this band. Right? You got to hear this band. Right? And so the music producer listens to this great tape right, that we don't even know exists. Right? And says, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. I, mean, I think um, Taylor Swift is on tour right now, right? And, and I preface this by saying everything I know about Taylor Swift I've learned by force. Um, but I do believe she's on tour, right? And I think she's got this stage where she's got like booby traps and trap doors and like she falls into it and then she gets like, it's like a carnival ride. She goes swish over there and she pops up again. So our little tape is so good that this mu music producer gets this idea in his head. When Taylor Swift drops down tonight, right, she's going to swish out into the parking lot. right? And, and our little band is going to be put in the little conveyor belt thing. And we're going to pop up. And we're not even going to be an overnight sensation. Right? It's, it's going to be like a this afternoon sensation. Because right? they're going to whisk us into this stadium. And we're just going to be you know, the next greatest band. Right. You laugh, but it can happen. And, and so he, he comes to get us, right? and he knocks on the garage door and says, hey, Carol and the band, open the door. Right? And the moral of the story is that you have to open the garage door. Right? You have to open the garage door. Right? In, in music terms, they say, book the gig. Right? You have to open the garage door. No one is going to beat the garage door down. And now you may be thinking, this is the dumbest story I've heard. Why is she telling me this, right? But how many of you have heard about someone that got an art show? I know I have, but I'm, I said I'm the poster child for this, right? You heard about someone, they got this art show, they got this really great art show, right? And you think, oh man, I gotta just, my work's gotta get better so I can get a show too. Right? The, if you want an art show, you gotta open the garage door, right? No amount of practicing is gonna get you a show. You've gotta get a show, right? Now, not, not, be careful what I'm saying because I wanna make it very clear. I'm not saying you shouldn't practice. I'm not saying you shouldn't toil. I'm not saying you shouldn't woodshed. I'm not saying you shouldn't all of that, right? You, you need to take best, the best photos you can, right? But know that if you see someone having success, if they're marketing their work and they're getting into opportunities, it's not happening because somebody beat down their garage door. It's happening because they took, they're active in their, they took themselves to the next level, right? What I'm trying to say with my silly little story, story time with Carol, is that you have to proactively seek out opportunities to get yourself to the next level. At some point, you're going to have to open the garage door. And like I said, I am the poster child for Tiara syndrome. I, I just leave myself in there and, and just don't do it. So some other things we can do with our mindset that I wanted to touch on briefly, right? 
if, it helps if you think of yourself as a brand. Right? And some people really hate this concept, right? They, they say like, I'm not Coke, I'm not Pepsi, I'm not a Kardashian, right? Start to think about yourself as a brand. What does that mean? Well, what's on brand and what's off brand for you? Right? I'll give you an example. In my case, when I started early on, I started doing gallery shows, right? I wanted to be in galleries. Now, if you do art fairs and festivals, it, the galleries don't want you, and likewise, if you do gallery, you know, it's vice versa, right? So my brand was gallery shows, not art fairs, right? You may want to do publications. You may not want to do, you know, I, have, I, I went to Cuba, I went to Havana earlier this year, and I went with a, a, a very good photographer. Um, in fact, I was the, the most beginner photographer there. There was a guy who, 50-year photographer, and we were talking about it, and, and he said, yeah, I don't, make, I don't put my artwork on merchandise. I don't want my artwork on T-shirts, on tote bags, or whatever. Um, you know, but he goes to all these art fairs in his area, and he sells his work. Right? I, I won't sell my work at an art fair. I don't want to pitch a tent and sell my work that way. I just don't really want to do it. It's not on my brand. Right. But when it comes to merchandise, like I told them, I said, I'm like an art tramp. I'll put my artwork on anything, right? I just don't care, right? Because to me, that's my brand. I actually enjoy making, like recently I've been putting more stuff on my website and I'm making phone cases and tote bags and t-shirts and I love designing them. To me, it's almost like another medium, right? I'm having a lot of fun with it, right? So I love it. I wouldn't stop it for the world. Right? But you have to decide, do you feel that for your brand, for you, for your work, is it cheapening your work by putting it on a coaster, a t-shirt, a coffee mug, whatever, or is it, are you okay with it? The point I'm trying to make is that a lot of times, if you don't make these decisions, they will be made for you. Right? So think about, you need to think about the big picture. Where do you want to go? What does success look like for you? How can your brand succeed? What does you know, what does the big picture look like for you? And work towards that, right? And that may mean deciding like what's on brand and what's not, right? So now another story, another Carol's little stories, right? So this one, we did music first, now we're gonna do food, right? So I'm gonna pick on Clay, cause he's smiling, right? So, so I have a friend and he comes to me and he says, um, I made a million bucks. I got this ice cream cart, and I'm selling ice cream. And I say, yeah, you know, I could use a million bucks. You know, I think I'm going to get an ice cream cart. It's a good idea, right? So I, I tell Clay, I say, Clay, I'm going to get an ice cream cart, and I'm going to make a million bucks. And Clay says, you know, I think I'm going to get an ice cream cart too. Say, That's a great idea. We'll, we'll sell ice cream together, right, Clay? We're each going to make a million dollars. We're going to sell ice cream together. So how do we do this? Well, we get the cart, we get the sprinkles. Right? Clay says, I want to get a nice sign that says ice cream. And I say, oh, I'm going to have delicious flavors. I'm going to have vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. Right? So we get our ice cream. Right? Then we get together and we say, we say, well, when do you want to sell this ice cream? Say, Saturday? Oh, I got a family thing on Saturday. Sunday? Not, can't do it. How about we get together at 2 o'clock in the morning? Yeah, I'm free. Right? We're going to go out in the church parking lot at 2 o'clock in the morning with our ice cream carts. And we walk around and we're going to sell our ice cream. So we get together at 2 o'clock in the morning. And we have our ice cream carts, right, Monday night. And what happens? How many people think we sell ice cream? Nobody. No ice cream, right? So Monday night comes, no ice cream. Tuesday night comes, no ice cream. So Wednesday night, we're out there by ourselves and we start talking, right? And Clay says to me, you know, I read a study. It said that... If you have a sign, you should have a sans serif font, right? <laughs> because that will announce, you know, people are more likely to think of it as an announcement. Okay. Maybe, you know, I'm not selling any ice cream because I have a serif font, right? And I say to him, you know, it's funny you mention that, Clay, because I sell vanilla in my cart, and I don't think my vanilla is good enough. It doesn't taste that good. It really isn't that tasty. I tried it, I, I don't know, it's, it's just, it's okay, but it's not that great, right? So you can see where the story is going, right? 
even if Clay fixes his sign and I fix my vanilla, what's going to happen, right? Are we going to sell more ice cream? No, <laughs> right? Now, note that we still, like Clay could still have a problem with his sign, right? We don't know if he has a problem with his sign or not yet, right? Why? We don't have enough data, right? We haven't had enough people stop at his cart and say, oh, I didn't know you sell ice cream. I couldn't read the sign. Or, yeah, I'll take an ice cream, right? So he still could have the problem of the sign. And my vanilla still could be a problem, right? But we didn't address the big root cause of the issue, right? So you, again, you may say, what is the, what is the? It says plant-based ice cream. cream. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, so, you know, you may say, well, what is the point of this little story? Why are you telling me this story time with Carol doesn't make any sense, right? I can't tell you how many people go to the ASF conference calls. And I don't know how the AS, ASF people don't like snap and, and break, you know, just go, you idiots, you know, because I've done it myself. They get on the call and they say, you know, because they, they have calls every day and you can, you know, you can say, I'm having a problem, you know, my foot hurts. And they'll say, put ice on. I'm having a problem. I don't have any shells and I don't like my font, you know, and they'll say, okay, do this, right? So they'll tell you, well, you know, okay, you don't like your font and you think that's not why you're selling. How many, you know, how many hits do you get on your website, right? <laughs> and you say, two. <laughs> and they say, and you're not selling 50 items a month and you think it's your font, right? <laughs> right. So many artists get mired down in and you know, entangled in this concept of, I have to make my website look perfect or whatever, right? But they're not getting the traffic, right? If, if you don't have the traffic, you don't have enough data to determine what's wrong, right? Your ice cream could be terrible, it could be really good, right? You need to get the traffic, right? Your problem is not your font or your ice cream flavor or even that you're selling ice cream or even that you're selling it at two o'clock in the morning, right? You have what's called, what they call a visibility problem, right? There's not enough eyes on your work, right? Now, if you were to go downtown at 6th Street on a really hot summer night, you might be able to sell ice cream at two o'clock in the morning. Likewise, if you go to the beach at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, what would happen? Probably be able to sell some ice cream, right? Why? You have visibility. Your, your product is visible to people who want to see and buy it, right? So did you bring any ice cream tonight? I did not. <laughs> I thought about it, but one other thing I'm going to tell you. So another, little, another part of this story. There was once a great philosopher named Willie Sutton. Does anyone know who Willie Sutton is? Yes. <laughs> I said he was a great philosopher, right? I didn't say he was moral, right? He wasn't morally sound, right? He was a very famous bank robber in the 20s and 30s, right? He stole, I think he robbed 46 banks. And on the 47th bank, he got caught, right? Interesting little story about Willie Sutton, right? I, I mentioned he's a great philosopher and not morally sound, right? So I, I'm a big fan of Law and Order reruns, right? So um, imagine, like, you know, it's it's the 20s, it's the gumshoe, it's the detective, you know, the FBI catches them. In those days, they they had the dark room, right? And the FBI would have the, the shoes, and they'd smoked, you know, and there's one light hanging over Willie Sutton, and the FBI's, you know, sitting there. And he's got the. I'm really. I never smoked, but you have to imagine. I'm, you know, and he says to him, "We got you, Willie." We got you dead to rights. You're going down. You're going down for the bank robbery, Willie. I just have one question, Willie. Why'd you do it, Willie? Why'd you rob all those banks? And Willie Sutton looks up from behind his handcuffs and he says, this is why he's a great philosopher, because that's where all the money is. <laughs> if you want buyers, you got to put your work in front of people. If you want to sell work, you got to put your work in front of buyers. If you want to save the whales, don't take photos of, you know, goldfish, take photos of whales and put them in front of what? People who save whales, right? It sounds really silly, but that's how it works, right? So be like Willie, learn from Willie, don't rob banks, but you know, great philosophy. So that's the Mindset Reset. Hopefully that was helpful, maybe a little entertaining.
Um, now let's talk about tools, tools of the trade. Um, this is where it gets really fun, right? So there's a lot of tools that you can use. Um, let's see, we have your photo or video, your headshot. Your artist biography, we'll dive into that a little bit. Your mailing list, important tool. Uh, your artist website, we'll go into that some. Your artist statement. Uh, and if you don't know what these things are, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll get in there. Your CV or artist resume. Your elevator pitch. Your social media. Um, your artist book or catalog. And um, I'm going to share with you what I do. It's called my priority action list, right? The things I do sort of, for those of you who don't know, I have a website called Carol's Little World. And it's the things that I do to keep Carol's Little World sort of humming along, right? So I have a priority list. and. I start at the top and work my way through. And you're welcome to, I'm going to share it with you tonight, you're welcome to customize this for your success. If you're submitting work to galleries, a lot of times they tell you what they want. They'll say, we send your bio and a statement and whatever to us. And so you will assemble those things and send them off to them. So your photo. Take a picture of yourself. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it, but if you don't have a photo, get one. If you have an old photo, get a new one. Um, resize your photo, make it square, make it portrait, make it landscape. Um, have more than one. Have what they call a BTS photo, which is a behind the scenes, right? So have a photo of yourself, either with your camera, with your tripod, working in the field, or you can, if you really want to sit behind your computer editing, um, you can do that too, right? Have multiple photos, be, be prepared. Um, one of the tips I do, I keep, I keep a folder called like shots of me on my computer and I, I keep my images in there because I'm always asked for my, my photo when I submit anything to anything. Um, so your homework assignment, your next homework assignment, I said I was a mean teacher. If you don't have a photo, get one. Um, help each other get BTS shots and um, be, you know, photos of yourself working. When, when we go on the rambles, when we're, when we're out, you know, share photos if you get photos of one another. Um, it's really helpful. Your artist biography. Um, this, when I joined ASF, they told me your artist biography is perhaps the single most critical thing you can do besides your work. And I didn't believe them. I thought, what? And the thing about ASF is they hit you with data. <laughs> and so they said, yeah, 60% of artists, the first landing page for them is either their featured favorites, um, highlighted, whatever they call it, and their artists about the artist page. Many artists don't update their bio very frequently. So what happens is if you do see it, if you rely on SEO, and don't worry if you know, don't know what that is, we'll talk a little bit about it later, it gets indexed in Google, so it comes up very high in your search. So it's, it's very, very common. And I thought, oh, they're, they're, they don't know what they're talking about. Right? Well, I was wrong, because now I have the data from my website, and my about page gets almost as much. They're really right. My featured in about pages are where people land. So it's really, really critical that you have a good artist biography. It is really critical. And many people do it wrong. Um, they make the artist biography about themselves, <laughs> which it sounds like it should be, right? The fact is people buy work for one of two reasons, or they, they enjoy work, they participate in work, they support you. Maybe if you don't want to sell work, you know, they'll, they'll support your cause if they either fall in love with the work or they fall in love with the artist. The purpose of your biography is to get them to fall in love with the artist, right? So you want to write your biography in such a way that it, someone expect, knows what to expect when they see your work and it makes them kind of want to fall in love with you as an artist. It's very critical. So it's so critical that I thought I would give us, and I'm going to come around and read this because I think it's really important. So actually, I'm going to stand, maybe so you can't see this one. I'm going to read this one, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, what do you think this person, well, uh, uh, let me read it first. Artist Jane Doe was born in Maryland and graduated from the University of Maryland with a BA in fine art. 
Since completing her university study, she has participated in an internship program with watercolorist Jan Min. She paints mostly scenic beach-themed artwork in a loose style she has adapted over time. Currently maintaining a studio in Ocean City, Maryland, her work has appeared in juried shows around the country. It's not a bad bio, right? It's not technically correct, right? right? Do you really get a sense of what she paints? Could you close your eyes and imagine what's there? What would be on her easel? Okay, okay, right, right. So, yeah, right. Doesn't really, you can't really close your, I mean, you said beaches, right? You maybe got beaches, right? But beaches are involved. Beaches are involved, but you're not really getting a vision of like a beach, okay? Beach theme, loose style, right? Okay, so let's look at this one. And this one still isn't even perfect, right? Actually, maybe I'm going to stand over here. The sea is never far from Jane Doe. Born on the shores of the Chesapeake, Chesapeake, she spent her childhood steps from the ocean before heading off to college at the University of Maryland. After getting her BA in fine art, she studied under watercolorist Jan Min before returning to the seaside town of Ocean City. You can find her flip-flops at her home gallery and studio mere steps from the ocean in Maryland. Now a world-class artist exhibiting in juried shows around the country, her loose style of painting reminds you of that feeling you get when your toes hit the sand and waves. Now, number two, if you were to close your eyes, do you get more of a picture of what she paints? Right, and it doesn't matter. She could be a photographer too, right? It doesn't really matter, right? That's why your bio is so critically important. Right? It's really critical. And even this, I think, could be even improved a bit more. Right? So your next homework assignment is to work on your biography. And I highly recommend, um, oops, 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 I went the wrong way. I highly recommend you review your biographies with each other. Right? Share them and, and critique them and see if there's anything you can, you know, Get them, get them up there, right? The next tool we're going to talk about, how are we doing on time? OK. Um, the mailing list. The mailing list is, for those of you who know me, I used, to, I used to show my work in galleries a lot, right? And maybe you know that more recently, I haven't been showing my work in galleries, right? What I've been doing instead is what I call selling off my easel, right? So I'm building a mailing list and selling directly to the people that follow me. There's a business model that says that if you have a thousand true customers, your community is a thousand people, you don't need, that's your career. You, you only need a thousand true believers to follow you. Right? It's, it's very true, right? Um, these numbers actually aren't pulled out of thin air. They come from the Harvard Business Review, they come, there was a book done once uh, called I'd Rather Be in a Studio. Um, the author talked about that. Um, ASF talks about these all the time, right? I'm going to uh, go over some of them with you. When your mailing list gets to one to 200 people, you probably have one collector in the bunch. Um, I'm gonna, be, before, I, before I go on, I'm gonna preface this. How many people have a mailing list already? Anybody? Anybody have an artist mailing list? Okay, you sort of do. Out of date. You have a really old, out of date one. Okay. So, your next homework assignment. Right. A lot of times when I teach this class, a lot of people leave feeling overwhelmed. They're like, oh my God, I don't even know where to start, right? I'm going to give you two places I want you to start, right? Business cards and mailing list, right? You can go to like MailChimp and get a free mailing list. The reason I tell you to start your mailing list now is because mailing list is cumulative, right? As you add people, they stay on, and when you add more people, it just grows, right? And the more you grow over time, the bigger it gets. And you may not want to do anything with it now, but in five years, you may decide, oh, I want to you know, open a studio, or I want to sell off my easel, or I want to do whatever. And then you have those, that community around you. Right. The way, the key to getting your work to the next level often involves finding your community with that visibility and then sharing your work with that community. Right. It's, it's really critical. So th that's the, if I can give you one key to success, that's it. So back to my list. 
Uh, one to 200 people, you probably have a collector. 400 or so people, you probably sold some work, have a couple sales. Not surprisingly, MailChimp will give you a free account up until you hit 500 subscribers, right? Why is that? They know that when you hit 400, you started making money, and hey, we can charge money from you, right? They used to give you a free account up to 1,200 subscribers, right? We'll go, we'll, we're going down the list, right? When, you're, when your mailing list hits 800, that's usually what they call the friends and family point, right? What that means is, if you get like your Aunt Edna and your Aunt Edna's friend and your Aunt Edna's friend's cat to sign your mailing list, you, pro you could conceivably hit 800 people, right? So it's possible that your mailing list contains everyone you know, right? And maybe you're extended, your Aunt Edna's neighbors and friends and whatever, but still people you kind of, friends of friends, right? Friends and family. Once you get past that point, there's probably people on your mailing list you don't personally know. They know you, they know your work, they know your story, they know you as an artist, but you don't know who they are, right? You've not met them. I have someone on my mailing list from Ohio, right? That's all I know about them. I have their email and they're from Ohio and they're a collector of them. Right? Don't know them, never met them, may never meet them, right? That's what happens when your mailing list grows. Right, in case you're wondering, my mailing list is about 1,400 people now. Right, so when you get to the 1,000 to 12,000 mark, you can now think about art as a career. Um, at, most businesses fail within the first two years, right? That's just kind of common knowledge. If you have a mailing list that's 1,200 people, the script is flipped. The odds are that your photography business will be successful because whatever you did to grow it to 1,200, in theory, you could grow it beyond that, right? So the odds are, tip in your favor. You, the odds of you succeeding as a photographer in a photography career, even in art career, are in your favor now, once you hit that all-important 1,200 mark, right? And that's simply because, you know, you've gotten enough collectors, you've got enough followers. 2,000 to 3,000? You'll be selling regularly, you'll have monthly sales, you'll have you know, more than one person contacting four or five paintings go out a month. You know. At 5,000, oddly enough, you're gonna need help. The odds are you're gonna need an assistant. Right? You're, you're looking at a six figure a year or higher um, income from your photography and you're maybe gonna need an assistant or you're gonna need help with your with yourself. So if you don't already have a mailing list, if you're not signed up for MailChimp, get one. Get one. So let's talk about websites, right? There's different types of websites and photographers can use them in different ways, right? I went, in, I kind of dove into three of them here. Um, I wanted to share some points about them, right? The first one is what we call a virtual portfolio, right? What is that? It's basically similar to a gallery packet, right? It's, it's showing your work in, gal, you know, in, in portfolio style, right? It'll have an about, a contact um, tab or information, right? Make sure you put your contact information on your portfolio page, right? This is for somebody that's maybe submitting their work to a gallery, right? And they want to set up their, their website so it mirrors a gallery packet. Right, so it'll have the, the like in my case, I did Poetry of Ice, right? That's one of my bodies of work. So I would have a Poetry of Ice tab. It would have the artist statement. It would have, you know, the list of images, the, um, you know, um, my CV, uh, my about page. Very important for any type of website, you want to have contact information. It is very critical, especially for a virtual portfolio, to have contact information. We're going to do another very brief story time with Carol. Imagine if you, uh, your name, your phone number, your email, and your address. And don't worry if you don't want to publish those, we're going to talk about that in a second. Right? I'll, I'll give you some, some tips on that. But let's say you get a gallery show, right? You get a big gallery show, right? Galleries usually have like a file cabinet in the gallery, right, where they keep information about the artist, right? So someone comes in and they say, oh my God, oh my God, I want to buy a Carol original, right? You know, does she have anything in blue, right? And they look up on the wall and everything's red. And say, hmm, let me call her and find out, right? 
this customer could be somebody that wants to buy 16 photographs from you, but they want them all blue, right? Do you have blue? Anybody here not have a blue photograph? Raise your hand. I want to see your, I want to see your portfolio, but you got blue photos, don't you? You're hiding. Maybe not at the gallery. Maybe you only have five photos up in the gallery wall, right? but you got blue photos hiding out there, right? So that gallery director looks in the file cabinet, pulls out your name, looks at, goes to carolsLittleWorld.com, houseofcarol.com, whatever your website is, right? If they cannot contact you in two or three clicks, they're gonna give up. If they give up, that buyer's gonna walk away. You just lost a sale of 16 photos, right? When I say you need your contact information at the ready, on your page, it needs to be there. It really, especially if you're doing a virtual portfolio. Now, if you're doing a virtual portfolio, you don't need to do pricing. If you're, this is usually what happens when you partner with someone to sell your work, right? So if you're selling through a gallery, the gallery may do pricing. You could do pricing or you could let the gallery set the pricing, right? Depends on how you, how you set yours up, right? But you don't have to have like a buy now button. You don't have to have prices right there. You can do a price sheet and sort of put it in there, right? But the idea is you definitely want your contact information. Right, and we'll go over this a little bit more, but for your contact information, if you don't want, like I, I, I don't want my information out in the world. I don't want, you know, I don't want my cell phone to ring and have that woman from Ohio call me right now. I'm a little bit busy, right? So what can you do? You can get a Google Voice, which is like a dummy phone number, it's a virtual phone number, and it'll go to a virtual phone box, uh, what do you call it, mail, uh, voice, voice box, thank you. Uh, voicemail, virtual voicemail, and then that will ring over to your cell phone. Or let's say you're like this year, earlier this year, I went to Cuba. When you're in Havana, there's no phone, there's no credit cards, there's nothing. You're on your own. If I had an assistant, I would have mapped my Google Voice to my assistant and said, "Hey, while I'm in Havana with no phone and no whatever um, and a map, not even Google Maps, I might get lost. You know, answer the phone, right? So I can send it to them." Likewise, if you don't want to reveal your address, you don't have to do that either. You can get a virtual PO box, right? Which is, it's really great if you travel because you can actually check your mail from anywhere in the world, right? And it's just, it looks like just a PO box, right? So you can check it virtually online. They'll scan your mail and send it to you. It doesn't cost that much. It's an annual fee. It's not, not that much money. Um, I have one that's, there's a, a PO place near my home. I can go check. They actually have physical mail or they'll scan it and send it to me. Um, so if you look at my website, if you go to Carol's Little World, it has my name. My name is my name. I don't hide my name, right? Carol's Little World is named after me. I am Carol, right? It has my phone number. That's not my, that's not this phone number. It's my Google voice, right? It rings over to my phone number. Should I care to answer my phone? It has my virtual PO box. It doesn't have my home address, right? It has my email is set up separately. So it's Carol at Carol's Little World. It's not my personal email as well. Right? I treat my Carol's Little World like a business, right? You so, actually get much you can um, for mine because I have the the storefront it's really important to have a, a, an address right people like to know where the work's coming from or how to contact you or how to you know I, I sometimes get get stuff and it's not too often okay. no um, most of its email most of my contact is email yeah, most of it's email, but it's a good idea to, um, how are we doing our time? It's a good idea to, you know, it's a good idea to put it out there, especially if you're doing a storefront type website. It, it builds trust, right? People want to know that you're a real business, you have an address, you have a phone, you have a, you know, whatever, right? It just builds that trust in your site. But it's very important to put contact information, right? You need a contact page on your website, even if you have a portfolio, right? You need that contact page. You need to be able, to, someone needs to email you, I need a blue photo, can you get it for me by Tuesday, right? Otherwise, you're gonna lose that. So it's very important, because what will happen, that gallery director will not wanna work with you again, right? Your work will be out of that gallery soon. If you can't meet, you know, if, you, they, if they can't contact you, they're gonna get like ticked off and they're not gonna wanna work with you again. I don't care how good your work is. Right. I don't care. They're not going to break down your garage door, right? They're going to run, right? So um, it's, it's very important. Now, if you are a portrait photographer, or uh, uh, I touched and got the dot, um, it's actually in the right spot, right? So if you are a portrait photographer, 
you might want to do something called the splash page, right? And what that is is just like what it sounds. It's one page, this is mine from, I have two websites, for those of you who don't know, I have Carol's Little World, which is my big fine art site. And I have a little portrait site that's not really, I don't do that many portraits, but it's called the House of Carol. This splash page that you see here is from the House of Carol. And what that is, is it's, those are portraits that I've done. And what you can do if you're a portrait photographer is make a, a grid with different portraits showing the type of work you want to do. So for example, you can see in mine, I've got some black and white, I've got some color, I've got, um, is B.B. King on there, so I've got some inter, you know, performers, I've got people wearing hats, I've got some street portraits, but I have no kids, right? no babies, um, no families. Right. Mine are all sort of artsy portraits, but some of it's street, some of it's models. I have a lot of props, a lot of hats, right? That's the kind of, photo that's the kind of portraits I do, right? So if somebody called me and said, you know, hey, I want to hire you for a portrait, right? they can look at that and see kind of what I'm going to do. Yes, question. I don't know if I'm jumping ahead of you here, no, but okay. if we have Adobe people here, if you have an Adobe subscription, they will host up to five websites for you. And it can either be so and so at Adobe Portfolio or something.com, or you can buy a domain like I, do, I buy my own domain. But yes. they host it for me. I've never tried to do storefront through them. Mm -hmm. But anybody, if you're already paying for Lightroom, if you're already paying for an Adobe subscription, you have a website hosting service right there. Yep, yep. I would recommend if you are a portrait photographer that you connect it with a calendar app and you set up a Book Me Now button, right, where you can take a deposit to book you. Right, and that's because it, it gives someone, you want someone, in this day and age with Amazon and everything, people want to buy this now button, right? So if you're a portrait photographer, you want them to be able to book you right now, right? So set up calendar slots that are open that someone can leave a deposit, you take their credit card, they land right on your, on your calendar, right? That way if they, if they blow you off, you get to keep that deposit. If they don't blow you off and you do the portrait shoot, you apply it towards their, you know, they're, they're sitting, their, their package fee, whatever you do, right? Um, you can also use something like Pixie Set if you're a photographer, that will do the printing kind of for you. Now a third type, um, this is what Carol's Little World is, right? It's a storefront, right? If you do a storefront type um, website, this is where you're selling prints directly to the public, right? It is very important. It has to have prices on it. Every piece has to have a price on it. Do not, do not, do not. You will make my blood pressure go up. If you, <laughs> you will make me get out the Zoltan and attack your website. If you put up a call me for prices, right? do not do that. No one is going to call you for a price of a frame 16 by 20 print. It just isn't gonna happen. You need to put prices up there. In fact, it's probably better to have a shopping basket and a buy me now button and allow the person to buy it right at that second and ship it right to them, right? That's what Carol's Little World is, right? You don't have to use art storefronts, but do not have them call you for prices. It won't work. In this day and age, it won't work. And also, you want to make your contact information as easy as possible. You still want to have a contact page where someone can contact you. Carol at Carol's Little World, my you know, fake phone number, my fake P.O. box, right? I, you know, we talked about real photographers, right? I, I guess I'm a fake one, right? Because I got lots of, lots of fakery going on, right? But I'm really Carol, right? So um, just keep that in mind. So one of these websites will hopefully serve whatever needs you've got, whatever, wherever you want to go. Um, if you're doing workshops, you maybe want to think about doing a virtual portfolio and organize it by the places you're going. So let's say you're gonna do a workshop to Namibia and you're gonna do a workshop to Japan, right? You have a gallery that says Namibia and you have a gallery that says Japan and your Namibia photos, you show either photos from Namibia or look like Namibia or something in you know, Japan, you show the Japan photos, right? It makes kind of sense, right? So any questions about the website? So is anyone here on ASF? I should have asked that. Are storefronts? Is anyone here on it? Okay, n not a problem. Does anyone here have a website already? Okay, so we've got a couple websites. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question. For those of you who have websites, do you have like um, galleries on your website? Organized? Okay, what, Stephen, what kind of galleries do you have? What are your galleries called? Uh, I've got galleries in landscape, and nightscape. So 
So by subject. Okay. Okay. Do you sell mostly to the trade or to? Was, you have a, do you have a storefront page or a virtual portfolio? Uh, or a splash page? More of a virtual. Virtual portfolio. Okay. So I have a storefront, right? And I sell more to the trade, right? Does everyone know what I mean when I say to the trade? Okay, so you can sell things directly to the public or you can sell through like interior designers, interior decorators, right? If you're selling to the trade, right? Even if you're not, people want to shop because they have a red living room. They want a red photo, right? It's got to look good over the couch. It's got to look good over the couch, right? They want red. They want a landscape port they want a landscape photo that's red, right? They don't care about if it's a mountain, if it's a land, you know, if it's a wildlife, it's, you know, in my case I have destinations, um, poetry of ice, gardens, right? They don't care, right? They want to know red, you know, vertical orientation red, right? Um, it's really important to have your website designed not the way you like it, but the way your customers like it, right? So think about, um, you know, if you have mountains and flowers, maybe think about making it red, right, making. And my website, I actually have a color picker, right? So you can go in, you can pick a color, and then it'll pull out all the photos that match that color that you pick, that theme. I also have another um, gallery basically called By Style, right? And what's in By Style? Well, cottage core, modern vintage, transitional, um, modern farmhouse. You know, things like that. Um, does everyone know what transitional is? I have, to, I have to tell a little joke, right? So an interior designer once told me, transitional is when you have one person in a marriage that likes modern and one person that likes Victorian, it's the type of furniture they buy so they don't go to divorce court. <laughs> <laughs> and that's actually a very apt description. It's sort of anything that it doesn't fall into a category that sort of doesn't clash with any other style. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, part of, that's part of the website, right? Is make it really easy, make your contact information easy, but make it easy, make it frictionless for the person to buy or view your information, right? Um, like I said, Google Voice, if you have to, PO Box, if you have to. Um, if you're doing a, a, a gallery website for portfolio submissions, make it mirror the submissions as best you can, right? Um, you know, have the CV, have the, all those tabs in place so that someone looking to give you a show can just sort of click through and go, oh, here's, here's this, here's that. Right? Um, again, you don't have to put prices on. If you're submitting your work to a lot of magazines, Right. One of the things you may want to do is have a password protected area or have a separate page on your website. Like, um, let's say you're submitting to te Texas Monthly, right? I could do like carolslittleworld.com slash Texas Monthly, right? And I don't have to link it from my web, from my main page. I can hide it and just send them the link. And that's very important because what happens a lot of times with magazines is, and periodicals, a lot of times you'll submit something like, um, I'm going to pick on cows, because earlier this week it was revealed that me being from New York City, I know absolutely nothing about cows, and I consider cows to be walking steaks, right? So, so let's say you, you go to, you're, you're out in West Texas and you photograph a rare ABC cow, and it only exists in this little town in West Texas, and you get a great shot of it, right? And you say, I'm going to send this to Texas Monthly, right? So you do your little page and you send it to them, right? Well, they may say, no, we don't want your image right now. But next year, maybe they're going to do a, a, a magazine or a publication called Crazy About Cows. Texas Monthly looks at the cows across Texas, right? And what do they need? They need an ABC cow, and you're the only one with a photo of it, right? How will they find it, right? That's why you want to set up a little site for them that, that will last, right? Because six months, a year from now, they may contact you and say, hey, remember that cow? You, you're the one with those cow photos. Can, can, we, can we have them? Right. It happens. Right. So if you submit your work to magazines a lot, that's a good way to do it. That's not the only way, but that's one way you, you may want to try doing it. Um, if there are any questions, please feel free to. Um, hopefully this is useful. Um, um, I'm trying to move along as well, too, so we, so we get there. When you place pictures on the website, what resolution do you, do you make the resolution lower so it's not cost, cost uh, usable? Or do you sign it or put some water marks on it or you don't care? You, just, you have to repeat the 
Oh, yeah, okay, so he's asked me to repeat the question. So the question was, um, for the website, what resolution do you use if I sign it, if I put watermarks on it? Is that, is that correct? You get everything? Okay, so for me, for, for Carol's Little World, I do full-size images because they're, I disable the down, down, you know, click to download, so it's protected. So my images are protected on Carol's Little World, right? And that comes through art storefronts. They have ways of doing that, right? So you can't really download images off of Carol's Little World. And it's a print on demand, so the, it has a display image, and then in the back end, it sends the high res to the printer once you buy something, right? On House of Carol, I use, because it's portraits, no one, they're not really stolen, you know, it's, it's demonstration purposes. But I tend to, if, like my blog, I'll, I'll size my images at 2100 pixels unless I'm told otherwise. Um, it really just depends on, on the site. Um, I'm not that worried about having my images stolen. Um, I figure at some point they will be. Um, that's, a, that's the price of putting things on the web. Um, but then also me putting my stuff on the web, it, it's gotten me my work in front of way more many people. Right? It's just kind of the cost of doing business, right? Um, I, there's various pockets I sell my work, right? I sell my work through Getty Images. Uh, we were talking about this before we started, but Getty Images has teams of lawyers and they will go after you. If you sneeze next to one of my images, they will say, you did not have a sneeze permit, we're suing you, right? And I just let them handle that because that's what they do. Right, but for the most part, for my personal work, um, on my websites, I don't really um, protect it. I do not use watermarks because I don't like them. Um, I think they interfere with the image and I've never found a happy place to put them. I get that some people like them. Um, you know, it, it's really what you want to do. Um, there are some less um, invasive watermarks, for lack of a better word, right? They're a little more subtle. Um, if I were doing watermarks, that's, that's probably what I would do. Um, let's see, what else, watermarks? Oh, and um, signing my images, I don't sign the images themselves. I do sell, I sell both limited edition and open edition prints. If you buy a limited edition print, it's signed, it's printed and signed by me. And that comes with a certificate of authenticity from me, and it's signed by me. Um, if you buy open edition print, it's not signed. So does that answer your question? Okay, sure, sure. Okay, so um, let's see, where were we? Um, oh, artist statement. So an artist statement is two to three paragraphs about the work. I'm not gonna read mine. Um, I put it up here, I put it in the notes. Um, just know that the artist statement is typically about the work itself. It's usually written in first person, right? So your biography is written in third person. Carol this, Carol this, Carol that. Right? We, we discussed Jane Doe, right? Um, how are we doing our time? Actually, we have enough time. Maybe I, maybe I should read this. I, I don't know. Well, I'll skip it. Um, I'll let y'all read the slides. But um, your artist statement is personal. It's you writing about your work. Um, it is... It should be specific to the body of work in question. It should be two to three paragraphs. And again, it should be very specific to the work, right? So it should cover like your motivation for taking the images, what you want to say about the images, um, how you want to craft them. You know, it's, it's the material that goes when your work is exhibited in a gallery that goes along with it, right? So if someone goes into the gallery and they're looking at the work, you know, I'm looking at that fish back there gone fishing, right? If that were your photo, right, it would be why do you take pictures of fish, right? Why, why that, you know, why that fish? Why, you know, answer those questions, right? That's what goes in your artist statement. Um, for me, I'll, I'll go through my checklist, but one of the things I do is I curate my work regularly as part of my social media presence and other things that I do. And when I do that, it becomes easier for me to create an artist statement, right? Because I'm constantly like segmenting and gathering my work in different ways. And when that happens, it becomes a little bit easier to do an artist statement. Um, it's one of those things you really should have one for if you're doing a show, um, if you're submitting work for a show, you may be asked to do one. Um, it, it is kind of important to do an artist statement. Um, I, you know, I said I have my poetry advice. I'll, I'll give you all the slides. You can read it. I would recommend you don't just take one example. Maybe you search for them and look through a bunch of different artist statements. Um, that's why I don't want to read mine because I think it's probably better if you see like five or six examples and get a feel for what, what they are, what a good one is. Um, 
you know, and, and hopefully that'll help you create yours. But yours should be personal, it should be written by the artist, and it should be personal in first person voice. The CV or artist resume, um, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but the CV stands for Curriculum Vitae. Um, and so for those of you who've written a resume before, has anyone written a resume for like a job? Right, yeah, most people have. Okay, so when you submit your resume for a job, you usually want to keep it to one or two pages, right? And brevity is the key. It really it makes you, you know, everybody wants to see a one or two page resume, right? They love you, right? The artist resume is the opposite. When you do an artist resume, you deliberately want what I call the thump factor, right? You want to put every show you've ever been in, every award you've ever won, you want it to be 97 pages long and have a big fat staple on it, right? Because it's not a true resume in the sense of the word, right? Now you may say, why are we doing that? That seems really ridiculous. It's overkill, right? Remember I gave us a little story time with Carol, right? The person came in and they wanted to buy blue photo from you, right? They go to the gallery director, they say, does Carol have anything in blue, right? Well, imagine if the same person goes in and says, I think I've seen this person's work before. Has she ever shown her work in Barcelona, right? The gallery director can pull out that CV, that thumb factor. Barcelona. Yes, as a matter of fact, she has done a show in Barcelona, right? It's a way for them to connect where you've shown work before. Because a lot of times collectors will go to the same galleries or they'll, they'll know the artist that they're buying from, right? So they want to know, did she show work? You know, has she ever shown work in Detroit? No, you must be thinking of another artist. Has she, she ever shown work in Barcelona? Yes, she has, right? That's how, that's why you have that thump factor, right? And all the awards and everything, that's what you want to do. You want to show the gallery, number one, that you're capable of printing, matting, framing, presenting your work. And then number two, you know, in case there's a question about, did she ever show work here? Was she in a show with, you know, was she ever in a show with, you know, in my case, someone may go, I'm really a fan of Christopher Jordan. Has she ever shown work with Christopher Jordan, right? They can look it up and go, yes, she has, as a matter of fact, right? They're not, they don't look stupid. Right. Here's a tip from me to you. If you make a gallery director look stupid, they won't like you anymore. When they don't like you anymore, what do they do with your work? Do they hang more of it up or they take it off the wall? Right. They, it goes out, right, yeah. out you go, right? So not a good idea. You want to care and feeding of your gallery director, especially if you're partnering with a gallery, to you get multiple galleries to sell your work, right? You want to keep them happy. The way you keep them happy, give them the contact information, make sure you have all the information they can contact you at any time, and make sure they have all the information they need to sell and market your work. Because when you partner with a gallery, they're doing the marketing and sales for you. You need to help them, empower them to be able to sell your work. If you want to sell work through a gallery, you have to make it easy for them to be able to sell your work. Hopefully that makes sense. The elevator pitch. I'm not going to talk about this too long. Um, we're kind of, you know, I want to get us going, but basically this boils down to a couple sentences about your work, right? Now we have a bunch of shows coming up, various groups. I know that Round Rock Image has a show coming up and Napes has a show coming up in October, right? So one thing I want to stress is that when you do an elevator pit, I'm going to do another story time with Carol, it's more fun. One time I was in a show down in Austin and um, it, was an, it was a little house, and I was in a group show. And there was actually another artist named Carol, not the Carol from any of the groups, a different Carol. She's a painter. And I was in the show, and I had to go help get food or something. I don't know why I was not in the gallery at the time. And someone came in, and they, they looked at my work, and they said, hmm, tell me about this. And Carol looked Carol was, is a very mature artist. She's, she's a great painter, great drawer. She's really, I wish I could draw like her. Um, I was in the show with her, and she spent 45 minutes talking up my work. She really talked to the guy. She really talked, she, you know, and, and she was, so, went, but, and the guy had to leave and didn't buy my painting, but she was so distraught because, you know, and someone told me when I got back, they said, you missed it. It was like an Olympic sport. Carol just almost tackled the guy. I mean, she was really good about talking up your work, and she almost had him. He had his wallet out, and then his wife called him, and she was just like, ah! <laughs> you know, so um, my point in telling you my little story time is that you need to, if you're in a group show, it's a good idea if you can talk about the work in the show, not just your work. 
Now, you don't have to know every detail. You don't have to know, like, I'm going to pick on Stephen, right? Stephen, you have beautiful landscapes. I know you went up to Canada. It was 50 below zero. You have beautiful landscapes. Imagine we're doing a show at Jester. He's got one of his beautiful landscapes up. Right? Someone comes, can you tell me about this? Oh my God, Stephen, he's a great photographer. He started out as a wildlife photographer. He's beautiful bears. You should see them. Now he's doing these gorgeous, pristine landscapes. And he braves the elements. He hikes into the middle of nowhere when it's 50 below zero. And he gets these wonderful, like, talk about the feeling of winter, right? It's just winter wonderland in his work, right? Right. I don't know the specifics of your f-stop and what camera you have. I, I can talk enough about you that hopefully by this time, you know, you've come back from the food or the bathroom or the beer or whatever you were doing. And I say, oh, here he is now, right? And, you know, and then you'll be there to open that wallet and get that, you know, sale, right? I mean, right? So. It's a good idea to be able to talk about everyone's work and yours too, right? So be able to talk about your own work. Elevator pitch. Hi, my name is Carol. I'm a fine art photographer. I live in Texas now, originally from New York. I love to shoot buildings, people, food. There you go, right? Very simple, right? You don't have to go into a dissertation, but, but there you go. Social media. There's so much social media. Right? Social media can really help you get visibility on your work, right? Um, for me, I schedule my posts on Insta and Facebook, right? So I use uh, Meta Business Suite, and it allows me to go in like once a week and schedule all my posts, right? It's very helpful if you have access to it, if you can use Meta Business Suite. I would encourage you to pick a couple social, social media outlets that you like and to not write for social media. Instead, what I try to do is be able to come up with what I call short form and long form content. Right? What does that mean? Well, two or three paragraphs about one piece of my work or like one or two lines about the same piece. Right? And then be able to slice and dice that. And if I'm doing a Twitter post, pick the short one. If I'm doing a blog, pick the long one. If I'm doing Insta, middle, right? And just be able to fit what I said, my content, into the platform that I'm using, right? I think that's the most helpful way to do it. But really, schedule posts. Um, it's really great if you can post every day. And if you can schedule them, that's the best thing you can do, right? Because you can, you can schedule them. Um, you can repeat content every like two or three months, right? You can plagiarize yourself, as they say. Right? You don't have to have new content all the time. Um, let's see, one other thing. Um, I mentioned you can, a, a lot of thing I do, Facebook also shows you these like National Cupcake Day or whatever, right? I always use that, it's like a freebie, right? I'll find a picture of a cupcake and say, oh, today's National Cupcake Day, right? There you go, right? Or I love Fridays. For those of you who follow me on social, you know, I love Fridays, right? I always post some silly dad joke on Friday, right, with a happy picture. Like, hey, it's Friday. You, know, you don't have to write a long post at all the time. The idea is you want to keep your grid moving. You want to keep your Instagram grid moving, right? You want, you want, you know, keep it going. But the other thing to be aware of with social media is that hearts and likes are not your community, right? You don't own your social media feeds, right? The Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, they're in the business of collecting and selling user data, personal information. Like that's their business model, right? They could shut you off at any time. I can't tell you how many artists I've met that said, well, I have a Facebook group with 400 people in it, so I'm going to sell a lot of work. Facebook could shut your group off. Facebook could change their algorithm. Your mailing list is yours. Right? Your mailing list is your community. You can communicate back and forth with your mailing list. Right? Those, those are your people. Right? Hearts and likes are not sales. Right? Now, that doesn't mean you should not, you should, everybody hate you. Right? Hearts and likes can help you. Right? A lot of times, if you, if you, for example, if you go on social media and you have a lot of artists following you, a lot of times you can find about opportunities through other artists. It's great. A lot of times artists will give you feedback on your work. They won't buy it, but they'll say, gee, I really, if you have 10 photographers jump in and say, I really love this shot, right? It's probably a good shot, but you might want to put it in your favorites, right? Or you might want to do something more with it, right? Make sense? Right? So, 
Social media, you, you kind of have to use it wisely, um, but it can, be a re it can really boost that visibility. Um, I list some of them here. Um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, for those of you, I will be starting a Twitter space soon. Um, I've gotten, I'm working behind the scenes, I'm going to be doing a Twitter space. I'll make an announcement about that soon. I'm going to do a weekly Twitter space where we put up some work and talk about it and I'll invite everybody who's interested to join. Um, but I think Twitter is actually a bit, bit of an up and coming platform right now. It's, it's not as many artists on it as, as other platforms. Um, but the, one of the things you need to realize about social media is that the platform of choice it really changes, the flavor of the month can change, right? So sometimes you need to be able to pivot to a different social media platform. And also demographics, demographics by age. Yes, some of them are more, TikTok is a younger crowd, um, Facebook is an older crowd, um, you know, it depends on your work, who, who your client is. Um, and like I said, they tend to cycle in and out. So, so these are just some of the ones. There are more. Um, I didn't even go into all of them. But. The artist book, um, I have one here. Those of you who know me know I shoot at the water gardens a lot. I just grabbed one of my books, right? This is my, this was old, but I did a book of my water gardens work way back when, right? Um, we talked about this a little when Mary did her presentation, right? There's two reasons, two ways you can do a book, right? One is to sell the book to the public, and one is as a, remember I said, when they read your about statement, they fall in love with you as an artist, and then they pick the piece of work that they want to buy from you. Right, so I want to buy your piece, so I need to see all the work that you have so I can pick out one, because I've already decided as an artist, I love what you're doing, I'm buying into your story. Right. I don't know what I'm going to buy yet, but I'm buying something. When I got my wallet out, I'm ready to go. Right. That's when you take an artist book, like a catalog book, and you show them here's, like I did one for my work in China, where I have all my China work in one book. Someone comes to me and says, I'm interested in your work from China. Here you go. Pick out what page you want, and I'll get you a print. Right. This is my garden book. This is, again, this is really old, but I'll pass it around in case anybody wants to see it. Um, but that's, um, that's more of a catalog book. Um, again, I, this could be a topic in and of itself. Um, so I don't want to go into this too much. But the book can be a very useful tool to help you raise your visibility. OK, so the list. So this is something that I work on. Um, does everybody know the concept of time boxing? Time boxing. Yes? Yes, yes. So what time boxing is, it's a way of problem solving where you say, I'm going to spend two hours on something. I'm going to time box it. And if I don't solve it in two hours, wherever I am, I'm just going to stop. Right. That's it. I quit. Couldn't solve it in two hours. I'm done. Right. That's, the, that's the concept of time boxing. Right. So what I've done in order to run Carol's Little World, I've created a priority list. Right. And I, there are two, two or three things that I do every week in order to sort of keep the lights on. And then I time box and say, OK, whatever else I can get through on my list, that's what I do. Some weeks I have a lot more time. I get down the list a lot further. Other weeks I get to number one and two, and I'm like, <sighs> I'm done. Right? I'm too busy that day. Right? Um, it's just a way to help me. So some weeks I keep the lights on. Other weeks I grow my business. Right? So for your brand, you may change your list around based on how, you know, what you want to do and how your brand is presented. Right? You, your brand may be on TikTok a lot. Right? So TikTok may be the highest priority. Right? For me, my brand is mostly Insta, Facebook. Um, I blog, and I have Carol's Little World, and I also sell on Getty and Minted. Right? So what I do is each week, I curate a set of seven images, right? I call it my curation of the week, right? This is a loose curation. What I mean by that is, um, I'll take a few examples. We went up to the Red Poppy Festival in Georgetown, right? Poppies, red poppies. There's seven images, seven images of red poppies, right? 
Now maybe you shoot a lot of flowers, right? I, I could just say flowers, right, from the red poppy festival. Maybe you shoot a lot of flowers, right? You shoot, you shot red poppies before, right? Not, not general enough. So maybe, maybe you, you do, you know, red poppies from Georgetown, or you do flowers, or you do just red, right? Pick a theme, right? general theme, right? Whatever it is, right? That's your, that's your curatorial theme for the week, right? And you can have lots of wiggle room. And if, if one week, if I don't want to pick a theme, I'll do like odds and ends. Right? But I really try to pick a theme every week. Then what I do is I gather these images in a folder. I get seven of them. I resize them so they're the proper size to post on social media, the 2100 pixels. Right? I get full size, 2100 pixels. If I'm doing a MailChimp mailing, it wants 800 pixels or less. Right? So I resize it all the different sizes that I need. So now I have one folder with seven images, all resized, sharpened, spotted, ready to go, right? Now these don't have to be new images. They could be old images, whatever. They just have to relate to the theme, right? So they may be red flowers, they may be Georgetown, whatever theme that is that week. Then I make sure they're launched. What I mean by that is they have to have a link somewhere for me to reference them, right? So they could be on my blog, they could be on Carol's Little World, they could already be launched. Some of them could be launched, some of them could be new, right? I may say Georgetown is my theme this week, and I have a couple old photos from Georgetown I really like, like let's say two, and I have five new ones. Put them all together, I get seven Georgetown photos. Some of them are launched, I would launch the, the others, right? Then I do this in order of priority, right? I put them on the internet, in essence, I launch them. I either put them on my blog, I put them on Carol's Little World, I put them on Getty, I put them on Minted. This will give me a URL that I can refer to them, right? Then I do one social post per day. I schedule it. I use Facebook Scheduler, and I schedule the post to post both to Facebook and Instagram, right? One per day. So now I have seven images, so you see I do this once a week, so you see what's happening. What am I doing? I'm, I said there would be math, right? I'm posting every day to Facebook and Instagram, right? But I'm really only doing it, what, once a week? Right, because I'm sitting down once a week and doing my posts, right? Um, then I send an email to my community about one or more of the images. Now lately, Art Storefronts has been generating email for me, so I don't um, clobber that. But if I weren't doing that, I would try to email my followers once a week about one of my images, tell a story, engage them, right? Because the idea is your mailing list is your community, your followers, right? Those are the people you want to talk to, right? Anything below this is below the line. Everything above this is what I really try to do every week, right? So now I, I continue as much time as I have as I'm willing to spend, right? As you have time, keep going, right? I do a blog post if I haven't done one already, right? I have Carol's Little World, the blog, right? This can include one or all of the curated sets, right? Sometimes I do one image on my blog. Lately, I've been doing like four or five. You know, doesn't matter, right? Whatever it is, do a set, right? I post it to LinkedIn, I post it to Twitter, I post it to any other platforms if I want to add additional platforms. I make an Instagram reel and story, right? This is really important right now because Instagram reels are really the way Instagram is getting engagement. Right, so what I've been doing for reels is I've actually been using my iPhone shots to make reels. So, if, does anyone know what reels are? Did I jump ahead? Does, is, it, is anyone not sure what are real Instagram reels? Okay, so basically I make the reels and I'm, I've been making those from my iPhone. So, for example, we went to the Georgetown Poppy Festival, I shot red poppies up there. Got a lot of iPhone shots of my red poppies. Made a reel, set it to like, um, I think Miley Cyrus Flowers, I like that song. So I set it to that popular music, but it was a very popular reel, right? So I'll do at least one of those a week if I can, right? Because that's important, right? Sometimes I'll research hashtags for the curated set. And the reason I do this for the set is because when I have the set, like Red Poppies, I can search for the hashtags once, optimize my hashtags, and then it will apply to like almost all the images. Now sometimes it won't, right? My, my curation might be Georgetown and I might have a portrait, a building, a flower, and then I have to kind of change my hashtags up, right? But this allows me to cut down on the time I spend researching hashtags, right? And hashtags are important for that visibility, right? Then I pick a piece from the set 
and I try to co-brand. For example, let's say I have an old car photo, right? I may um, look for a car wash or something and see if they want to do a promotion with me, if I have time. Right? That's another thing you can do. Co-branding is a great way to increase visibility, increase traffic, increase your follow count on Insta and social. Right? Um, I research Facebook groups and try to put it in, try to dump my image in Facebook groups. You have to be careful with this one because a lot of times Facebook groups do not want you to just sort of dump and run, right? You have to participate. And sometimes you can't join as a business, you have to join as a person. And so there's this weird funnel that happens on Facebook, right? You have to join a group, post the photo somehow, get them to think you're you know, not just dumping your photo in there. And then when people comment on your photo, invite them to either be your friend or like your page, and then share your post. If you have a business page, share your post from Facebook business to your personal page. Right, so for me, I have a, a business page, Carol's Little World on Facebook, and I have my page, Carol Giraldi, right, and you can add friends to Carol Giraldi easier, right, and then I invite people to like my business page, right, so that's, and I share things from my business page to my personal page. But again, you have to be careful with this because with Facebook, there are rules, and you cannot share things like sales and businessy speak to your personal page, right? So if I have like 25% off, use coupon code, I can't share that, right? So the post that I do every week, I don't include the business end of it. The business posts, like the 25% coupon or whatever, those are generated by my little machine, right? So I, I don't share those to my personal page. I make a video, right? I can make a video of the work. Um, easy thing to do. You can enter shows based on the curation. Usually I don't do this. When I hear about a show, because um, I remember I'm the poster child for Tiara syndrome, when I hear about a show it's usually almost too late um, and I just try to figure out what I have and throw it in rather than enter my work, but you could do it this way too if you wanted to. Um, I get feedback from my images. Again, I mentioned if you're on Insta and you have an image that's really popular, right? Maybe you want to do something with it, right? Another thing to do is see if you can combine your curated sets, right? I mentioned I curate in gr groups of seven, right? Because that gives me one post a day. Well, seven times three is what? 21, right? Most galleries want 20 images, right? So if you have three curated sets that kind of go together, you have a body of work. You can enter that as a one-person show in a gallery if you're so inclined. Right, you just cut one or two out, maybe add a new one in, right? It makes it easier to curate your own work, right? Because you're curating every week and then you can combine those into a bigger thing. Or like in my case, um, I shoot the water gardens a lot, right? I call it my borrowed garden, right? Because um, I don't, I kill all plants and I go there and everything's living, right? So a lot of times I'll shoot pottery or I'll shoot the fish or I'll shoot whatever is there, right? So I might have, you know, seven images of fish, seven images of pottery, seven images of grass, right? I can combine those into a bigger body of work, right? It's one thing I can do, right? And then I can think about, like, do I want to do an ebook? Do I want to do just an ebook called The Fish of the Water Gardens? I don't know, right? It's a good way to sort of slice and dice my work up, right? So this makes sense? Does anybody, hopefully this is helpful. Um, has anybody lost? How are we doing on time? We're probably way, way late, but um, I will try to hurry us along. So we're coming to the end, actually. So we talked about a lot of stuff, um, a lot here. The mindset reset, getting our mind in the right spot. Now we're going to put it all together, right? So this should be the exciting part. So everybody, wake up! Um, mindset reset, right? we got our head in the game. We talked about imposter syndrome and tiara syndrome, we're not, we're not gonna do that to us. We're not gonna sabotage ourselves, right? We're gonna get our work out there, right? We got tools in place that we can make ourselves successful, right? The tools, you really have to have a fake it till you make it mentality, right? Like get your Instagram to a thousand followers, put your bio and all your, put your headshot and all your profiles, right? Fill everything out so it looks like you're, you know, you're there, right? Um, Visibility, we talked about the all important visibility. Right? Even if you don't want to sell work, or right, if you want to save the whales, right, you've got to have some visibility on the work, 
right? That's the key. Most people think they have a quality problem. They think they have, a, a, you know, they have other problems. The real problem that most artists have is a problem of visibility, right? You lack visibility on your work. It's just simple, simple, right? So before you go yeah. on, yes. a couple things uh -huh. on your long okay. list of things. Uh, okay. Yeah, I want to yeah. go back to that for just a second. So yeah. I want to I point out here, uh -huh. A, you post to Instagram, you can have it post to threads. And in my opinion, threads is what Twitter used to be before it became a fascist playground. So ASF just has saying. said, yeah, yeah, I thought, I, I dug into that, right? So ASF has said, I asked them about it, threads is losing followers right now. Is what? Is losing followers. I'm just saying it's yeah, free. It, you can, you can. It's, it's yes, free. Absolutely. You just, you just turn on the switch and it yeah, just doesn't. Yeah, yep, okay. yep, you can post. Um, yep. I, th I find it more entertaining, frankly. A lot of people do. I'm staying away from it. Yeah. But I mean, it's, again, it's your brand, right? Yeah. So if you okay. like it and it works for you, okay. use it. Other, other points to make here, mm -hmm. uh, other points I wanted to make is, is um, you talk about scheduling, mm -hmm. uh, you can write, there are platforms where you can write a blog post and then it can send information about that blog post to Twitter, et cetera, announcing yes. that a post has been made mm -hmm. on your behalf. Mm -hmm. uh, so that can be helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. You just have yep. to figure out your platform. Hold on, hold on, you, sorry. That, you have to, can you not hear me? I'm using yeah, my conference now, call now voice. Now we can hear you, yeah, now, we, now we can hear you. Sorry, you have to I, figure I, out your platform. I'm a nag that way, but. The, yeah. You have the, to figure out your platform. Yes, yes. Uh, two, um, and, and then finally, uh, because there's a, there's a lot here that could engender a, a long discussion, but I want to point out that one of the key elements here is learning to write about your work. Yes. Okay? Yes. Yes. And that's, I think, one of the hardest things, so I'm going to offer two suggestions, mm -hmm. one of which is if you're not on Instagram or Twitter or whatever where, where photographers are posting, I think Instagram is still the place to go yeah, for that. Instagram is still go the Go find one. photographers on there and see how they're posting and what they're writing because you can sure. learn from that. Mm -hmm. Two, mm -hmm. the platform that I think we should be paying attention to is Substack. A lot of people writing on Substack mm -hmm. that are photographers, mm -hmm. not writers. Yeah. They're using yeah. that as their base platform. Plus, you can, opt, you, you can um, fold over to subscription model. Mm -hmm. uh, people are doing that, so you get paid for writing, all right? But there are a lot of photographers on there that are writing. I'm trying to find the ones I like. I see a lot of bad yeah. writing, yeah. Yeah. but it's a learning experience, mm -hmm. so the point I'm trying to make here is if you're going to do this, you have to put the work in to understand what is required to make any of this work. And yes, writing is, yes. a, I think, a very fundamental part of that. It, it really depends, too, on the platform. Like, I started as a blogger, and blogger is very much about writing, right? Now, if somebody is a painter, and they don't write at all about their work, they could still be successful on socials. They just have to come up with a way to keep it simple and, and you know, short and sweet. Right. right. So you do still have to write about your work, but you can make it, um, you know, it, you don't have to write a dissertation, right? right. But for right. me, since I started really as a blog, in many ways, I, my first social presence was blogging. I've always written, I, I was a writer when I was young too, right? So that was part of, that's part of my brand, right? So that's why I don't shy away from the platforms that require more writing, like the blog. Right, whereas other people may not want to do a blog, it's too much writing about their work. Right, if you're the type of person that you do the artist statement and you're like, phew, I'm done, right, you may not want to blog, you may not want to substack, right, you may just want to stay to the Instagram. Right, you really have to look at your brand and what fits in your brand. Right, and you may want to do more video content if you're the type, you know, painter, because you can do like the behind the scenes, you know. That sort of thing, right? So you really have to dive into what makes sense for you. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, so, so getting back to our success, formula for success, right? We talked about sort of our summary, we're coming to an end, right? It, the long train of caboose is coming, the train is, has a caboose, right? Mindset reset. You have to have your mind in a good spot. You might have more than the two problems we mentioned. I mentioned the fear of dark room, right? I have an irrational fear of dress forms from when I was a child. Oh, and I'm afraid of that road, that causeway that goes out to Key West. That thing was horrific. Um, when I was a kid, I went on the old wooden one that fell into the sea, and you know, I'm, I'm afraid of that, right? But um, I've covered the two that are the most common. Uh, tools, we talked about the tools to have. 
to set yourself up for success, right? There's a lot of tools. There's a lot you can do. There's a lot you may want to do. There's some stuff you may not want to do. Right? It's up to you. Hopefully, you got some information about what, where you can go with this, right? Visibility. You have to have your work visible to the right. You know, Willie Sutton, right? You got to go to the bank where the money is, right? Ice cream cart, got to go out at not at 2 o'clock in the morning where the people want the ice cream, right? Um, spend time growing your community and making images, right? I really think the most successful photographers, that's what they do, right? They spend the majority of their time creating and growing their community, feeding their community. Right? That's how you, you can get there. Right? Bonus points. If you have a sense of style, a subject, or you can gauge an aesthetic. What do I mean by that? Well, people come to you for a certain look. You know, think about Cher as a singer, right? She's a very distinctive voice, doesn't she? You may not like Cher, but you can recognize her, right? Very distinctive voice. Some of you might not know Cher. Um, photographer Gray Mallon, right? Very, um, has, he's one of the, I think he's the highest grossing photographer, living photographer now. How many people have heard of Gray Mallon? Anybody raise your hand? Ah, see, this is because you're at two o'clock in the morning at the bar and he's selling ice cream on the beach at two o'clock in the afternoon. He sells a lot of ice cream. I think he is high six figures. I want to say he's 10 million in sales. I don't, I'm, not, I'm wrong about that. Maybe, maybe even higher. I don't know. He has a very distinctive style, right? When you look at his stuff, you go, oh yeah, that's great now. Very distinctive style. Um, maybe you have a certain subject, right? Has anybody here heard of Jonah Allen? You have, you know, Jonah Allen. Okay, so one person. Again, another very successful photographer. On track for $2 million a year in sales this year. He's on art storefronts. I've had talks with him. Another, another aspect, another thing to consider. With the ice cream cart, Clay and I are out selling our ice cream at 2 o'clock in the morning. Right? We're, we're out there, right? If you get an opportunity to talk to someone who is selling ice cream, right, and they're selling a lot of it, take it. Right? Try to surround yourself with people who are more successful than you, and you know, do what you can to learn from them. Right? Have lunch with them, treat them to coffee. You know, whatever you can do, try to figure out what the secret sauce is that they're doing. Right? Learn from them. Right. I was lucky, I, recently I had a long conversation with Jonah Allen, right? um, got a lot of tips from him, great conversation. But he shoots a certain subject, he shoots oceans, right? he only shoots oceans, he's, he's subject based. Right? Joe McNally, he's someone who can gauge a style, he can gauge an aesthetic. Right? If you, I, I call it the Billy Joel piano man, right? for those of you who don't know that there's a Billy Joel song. He, he's singing in a piano bar, right? And like a, a guy comes in alone on a Friday night, he sings a sad song, like he figures he's alone, he gets a big tip, you know, that kind of thing, right? Joe McNally, if you go into his studio and you're wearing like all goth clothing, black, you know, he's not gonna show you flowers, his flower portfolio. He's not gonna show you dancers, right? He's gonna show you moody images. Right? He figures out what you want as a customer of his and he gives you what you want. He shoots a lot, right? He'll even tell you, I'm a shooter. Shoot a lot, right? shoot a lot, shoot a lot. Right? But he's able to say, you look like a guy that likes, and he's right, right? He's Billy Joel's you, right? If you can do that, if you're a shooter, I'm a little bit of a shooter. I have a little bit of a style and a little bit of a shooter, right? I do not shoot per subject. I shoot everything. I mean, I guess I say I shoot buildings, people, food, but you see I have a garden series, right? I, I'm a little all over the map on subject, right? I have a good friend who shoots lighthouses in Maine. Right? Very specific subject, right? That's one subject. Right? I don't do that. I shoot everything. Right? I'm all over the place, right? So I'm more of a shooter, right? So if you're a shooter, you, you want to learn how to gauge an aesthetic if you can, right? So with that, we've come to the end of our Thank you for sticking with me. Um, for this part, basically, if anyone has any questions or if anyone has any problems or just wants to discuss anything more, everybody's probably frazzled by now because I've hit you with so much information. Hopefully, was this useful? 
Um, did anybody learn anything? <laughs> I hope so. I hope it wasn't a waste of your time. Um, if anybody, um, you know, like I said, to, to wrap to just one last thing, you may be feeling daunted, like there's a lot here. Um, business cards and mailing list. Yes, question. Yeah, recently um, Adobe changed their terms and conditions. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Everybody in here is grinning backlash about that. Was like, so, yeah. <laughs> Do you use their cloud storage? I because don't. Because that's where it, that, that's where it uh, attaches to. I, I don't. I use Backblaze. So okay. that's a different cloud storage place. Um, but it's a, big, it's a big problem. And there's also a problem with AI, right? There's now a problem. A lot of images are being used to train AI. So art storefronts had sort of an emergency thing where they said, we're turning that off so that your images won't be used for AI training. Right, uh, that's a problem too. Um, there's always, with social media, there's always weird problems, right? Facebook, there's always the, the guy who's the surgeon or the Nigerian prince who wants all your money. I mean, you know, it's just, you know, I had some guy who kept trying to marry me and wanted me to pay a goat to get, I don't know, you know, I get, <laughs> it's brutal, right? Um, do what you can. You know, there's gonna be scammers, there's gonna be annoying people. It's part of the landscape that is, you know, the bucket we call social media. Thank you for coming. Oh, yeah, question. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead. One last uh, question. One time on a, hold, a, hold on. Right. actually on a Facebook, I placed on somebody else's website, I placed my picture and some woman, lady from uh, Ireland messaged me that she wants to buy this picture. And I had no idea how to sell it and I didn't know if it's a lady or not or whoever it is and I, I I didn't really respond. I didn't mm -hmm. know what to do. Is, do you have some, how, what, you, what would you do th in if, case if you, like this? If you don't have a website set up, it's difficult to sell one-offs, right? Because you have to have a way to take payments, yes. right? So if you don't have a way to take payments, it's kind of hard to um, sell something, right? So you have, to, you have to figure out a way to, to, to sell that, that way, you know, if you need to process the payment. Right? So that's one of the things. You have to have a way of yeah. accept payments. Yeah, like and, for and me. And then how would you sell the picture? Just send the JPEG? <laughs> well, if they depends. wanted a digital download, I would sell that at, like a digital file. I would. That's a different thing to sell. Um, I don't usually sell my work in that format, but that's something I would negotiate if they really wanted. Right? For me, I sell framed prints, ah. right? So what? So and I take payments, right? So what would happen? They'd go to my website. They'd pick the size and the frame and everything they wanted. And it would ship straight to them. And you would ship it to Ireland? Yes. It ships internationally, right? So that's, that's how it, it works. There's a lot of options you could use around there. I mean, you could use uh, Etsy. You could use eBay yeah. if you want to pay that fee. Yeah. Uh, most of these websites, I'm sure, are storefronts. Yeah. 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 Has a storefront. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Zenfolio, Squarespace. Yeah. Yep. A lot of them have options for that. If you have a website set up, mm -hmm. you have that option. Uh, you could do PayPal, like something like PayPal, and take the money and then ship them a print. I mean, that's another that's another format you could do. Any other questions? Thanks for sticking with me. I'm sorry it was so long. <laughs> any questions? I think everybody's dropped on online. If you have any, if you think of any other questions, let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. We do appreciate your uh, presentation this evening, and I'm sure a lot of us will have learned a lot of things out of that. Thank you. Um, Clay. Yes, I want to thank Paula Smith for her membership renewal, and I also want to introduce Charlie. He is from Round Rock, and he's visited several times before. He's going to give us some news about Round Rock. <laughs> OK. Hey, everybody. Charlie Favre with Round Rock Arts. I'm a photographer. Uh, I was a member of this organization about five years ago, and at the same time, I joined Round Rock Arts Gallery Committee, and I found, fell down the exhibiting rabbit hole, and uh, other things just fell by the wayside, so uh, good to see some, some of y'all again. But uh, I've got three things for you tonight, real quickly. Uh, for the 
imposters and the tiara people. <laughs> if you have a homework assignment, we just had some space open up at Texas State University. Any of you know where Texas State University Round Rock is? A.W. Grimes and University Boulevard. It's an amazing, beautiful space. The fourth floor, the top floor, is currently booked for a show that uh, closed a couple of weeks ago. So pet portraits, too late. But flora what and fauna. fauna, we just opened a call. The third floor opened up to us. Three, you can submit up to three pieces, $25. It's a juried show, so you're, you're not automatically in. They're juried in. Uh, but I'm sure we've got a lot of people with flora, fauna, yeah. The, the Hill Country Gardens could be there. Yeah. Uh, so uh, would love to see you there. Uh, there'll be a reception July 21st, I think. Oh, the deadline is June 30th, so it's a quick turn. So go to roundrockarts.org. Uh, you'll see the call or talk to Carol and she can contact me, yes. Charlie F at roundrockarts.org. Uh, second thing, uh, I want to thank you all for making the jester annex building so beautiful these past few years with your annual show with us. I think that comes up in October. Yeah. Uh, our show is in August or September. Round Rock Yours is August, September. Okay, I looked it up wrong. I, I flipped them, okay. No, he's with Round Rock Image Creator, so they're first. And yes, okay, so you, oh, you're Gary. Okay, hi. Uh, so yes, the Image Creators has that, and then we have uh, North Austin Good Photography names. Society right after that. So it'll be a back-to-back -back photo. Uh, out there. And Terry Cook, the commissioner there, she loves the art when it goes up, uh, so it's always very appreciated. So thank you for sharing that. And the third thing is uh, Round Rock Arts is a nonprofit. We present 17 exhibitions a year across our three venues. We are volunteer run. We have one paid employee who puts in 20 hours a week. Uh, if any of you have a background in accounting, we're looking for someone to help us with uh, managing our books. If any of you want to join our board, events, marketing, uh, it's a lot of fun. And we just had a new board member join us here this <laughs> season. So I wanna welcome Carol to the board of Round Rock Arts. And just thank you for all doing what you do, creating and sharing. So thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, and now I'll have one last announcement. Um, for the Hold next the competition, uh, you will, we're not meeting on the 4th. And so normally the, you would be able to start submitting after our meeting on the 4th, that's still the case. So on the 5th, go ahead and you can start submitting your images for, uh, for the Hold August the one, but Hold it's the, the macro. Hold the mic up. Hold okay, <laughs> it's for the macro one and um, then on the 11th, we will still meet and, and do the judging of the current one, which is... Uh, Open. Open. No, it, it, it's monochrome. 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 Uh, and so we will have a meeting where we'll still talk, but you can start submitting to the next one before we have that meeting. I'll send out an email at that time and let you know that you can start submitting. I just wanted to be sure that you knew and you could start getting your pictures together but we're keeping every, all of the dates the same so that we have enough time to submit and to judge and everything, even though we're having one meeting that's a week behind. And Pat, do we have a third Thursday program for July? For July? I think it's August that you're um, thinking of. No, no, uh, no, third Thursday is our normal second meeting. Is there a speaker for? The third Thursday. Oh, oh, yes, I'm thinking August. fifth Thursday. Yeah. yeah. Don't don't okay. scare me like that. Do we have a program in August? We have we have uh, Laszlo. We have a social. Yeah, we're supposed to go that to the painting place Thursday. on the fifth. So. Yeah, June June we have four Thursdays. July we have four Thursdays. August we have five Thursdays. So. Third Thursday. Is there a but do we have a plan for the third Thursday in July is the question. That's a good question. Because I, 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 have, I have ideas that we're going to talk about. 
So okay. We, we don't well, know yet, but I not, have ideas. We're not riding home in the same vehicle tonight, so no, we're, I know. We're, we're going to have to get together. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I would have to check the calendar. I don't have it yeah. with me. I'll talk time. to him, and then we'll figure it out. And we'll get a slide about it at the one on the 11th, telling what the following week what the, will be yeah, about. Yeah, the one on the 18th. Yeah. 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 Whatever. Whatever that is. Okay. Yeah. Good. And so, one last thing. Take my business cards on the way out as a sample. I forgot to say that. Sorry, I left some cards out here for folks can grab a card. Very pretty. Should have yeah, very pretty. pretty. You want to help put chairs along that row of tables? Thank you. Thank you, oh, yeah, thank thank you. you Pat, for the church as a location. Oh.